talk about the silver rice tree. Okay. And then we can talk about the baseball. Yes, sir. I was making well, working at G then when this came out. My children were small. I had three children, two girls and a boy. Well, the little the smallest girl, I'd say she was about eight or nine years old. <clears throat> and I came home from school and she had the TV going and she was crying, just crying boo-hoo. And when I walked in, she says, Daddy? I said, what? She says, would you? I asked her, I said, what's the matter with you? She says, come in here, I want to show you something. And I walked through there, and just about the time that I walked through this occult, they had had a certain like you do the houses and things when they're on fire, and it hit that woman in the, right in the back with the water. And she flew far from here to the picture over there in the corner, and she knocked her that far. Then they turned the dog to loose on her. And finally they got the dogs back and they started it back at this and on. She says, you got to go down there and stop that. I said, I wanted to laugh. I said, you say, well, you want me to go down and stop that? I said, never. She says, yes, you can. Then it hit me on this side. The children can think their parents can do anything. That, uh, and she had those thoughts. Well, when I went back to work the next day, I told the guys about this, and two of them right quick jumped on that. I said, well, I'm going down. They said, well, we'll go with you. I said, well, that's fine. And the time come for the go, they backed out, and I had to go by myself. That's 400 and some miles back then. So when I got there, they were still there doing this. In the church, they'd go in the church. To sleep, that's where you slept. All you did was to pull your, pull your shoes off and lay on the church bed. Then they had a building that they have a little meetings to try to figure out how they could do. What they was wanted was to get to the schools down there and get to the capital especially of the two. And Martin wasn't there. He was out on the road, Martin King was. But he had some fella there helping him. And you could see automobiles. You couldn't see the end of them. They were so far. Had that many out. And they had these sticks. And then you come up to the wall. We had to go up there with the hands like this. We thought that nobody would get hurt. But we were wrong there. And when you walk up to the place and either make a dot to get through, they'd hit you with those clubs that they had. Well, the ambulance for the hospital was right over on the other side. And they would take you and put you in the hospital, they'd put you in the car for the go to the hospital and take you away. These kind of things went on for four days. And I left after four days. I was mostly taking pictures myself. And I have a lot of those pictures up there, just what you guys walking around and doing everything. And it didn't come about until Martin Luther was killed. In fact, he had two people guarding him also. And they were staying in this motel that had a, a kind of, and he walked out on the patio from this hotel. So they tried to get him to come in, and they really don't know yet who really shot him. I said, there's other guys around, other people with this stuff. So they don't know exactly like who Martin Luther King yet all of these days. And so, it's just one of the things that we run into a long time ago. And my, that same little girl that told me I could stop it, a group of guys got together and she went with them a long time afterwards. This was gone. 
but they were still trying to separate this thing to go get to school. Well, we couldn't go to the school, but the president, we had a president, which was beautiful. And he sent the, uh, the policeman, he sent them down. And he had the, the black people going together with them. And they were taking them into the school, into the white school. They would walk into the white school. That was one of the ways. But then still, it wasn't any good too much because they, the law couldn't stay there all this time. And if they started to go in, they'd get a whipping or kill it. One little boy was killed because he whistled at one of the, one of the men, one of the women. He whistled at one, they killed him. Took him out and beat him up and laid him stepping on the beach. That's where we found it. It was out there on, on the beach. These things, these things were really prevalent. But somebody had a heart. Sears and Robux, you know, they're coming. Well, the man that was heading Sears and Robux, he went through the South building schools for us. Building schools for us. And I was a young guy. I was one of them, one of those schools. I went to one of those schools. But I was a sixth grader then, before they got there. It was just a hill and a blocking in between and all that. And no food or nothing. Another like that. just straight buildings with a petition between the but a lower grades and a higher grade. Then there was desks that you could sit in. There had two to sit in the desk. And then you could have a place in there to put your books and everything like that. And it was brand new. So it was about three doors from where we lived. There in Flat Rock, Tennessee. So I was, that was the first school that I ever went to was that one. <laughs> this is funny. So a lot of the kids, we know them. We know them all around, the black kids, because we had the, the church. It was right across the street from where we lived. And it was an all-black church, you know, it's all the great people. All right. You carry your lunch to show. And when you eat them. Meat. And anything, you didn't have no tissue paper or nothing like that. Me, and anything, would grease up the newspaper when it came through. And when they would inhale that grease, it would just about drive you crazy because it smelled that good. Mm -hmm. was, uh, well, I'd done about nine of those from one desk to one desk. Biting off of those, <laughs> biting off of those things. Well, the little girl, I'll never forget, her name was Sarah Brown. And she caught me eating her, out of her there. I wasn't hungry, I was just going from one place to her. And she told me, and she said, Miss Gwen, Tom Turner's eating my lunch. <laughs> and that went to the other people just find out about that night. Well, Miss Gwen was the teacher. And Miss Gwen really heated me up. She called me up front and laid me on the bench and took the paddle to me. But well, I didn't go in the middle more for lunches after that. I got that. But that was one of the incidents that happened in the new plant. At 12 years old, we moved from Tennessee to Ohio. And I was 12 years old when we moved there. My grandmother was a slave. She was a slave. And her husband was dead. I didn't get to see her husband when we, but he had left her 
150 acres of land with four homes on it. Well, we did <coughs> farming and sago molasses is what we cook. We made them and cooked it right out there in the right there in the ground. We didn't go on to nowhere. Huh? On your table at this type of sea, you see a little child with the, uh, that uh, molasses and one of butter, a little thing for butter, and then hot biscuit coming out of the kitchen. Uh, that was your meal for breakfast. Like, uh, well, that's what we had, and it was excellent. She was making uh, black bear wine. Ooh. And it was raining and everything. And she asked me, she said, uh, you want some? I said, yes, ma'am. So she gave me a whole glass full, like that. And I drank that stuff. And boy, I'm telling you, it tasted good. It was sweet, you know. I love the sweet. I said, will you give me another one? She said, yes, same thing. When I got about half through with that, and my head started going round and round and round and round. And I didn't know what to do. I fell off the porch all the way down on the ground. During those days, your porches for your homes were, were as tall as this for here because of the vomit that gazed around. They couldn't get up in there. And you really had to have the hub high. And that was the last time I had anything with alcohol in it that day. Well, as a young man, uh, we could go to Cincinnati and, and have our clothes tailor-made. The boy men could. So I just had my suit, a suit tailor-made. I took my girlfriend to a dance. And we went up to the bar to get something to drink, and she ordered whiskey. And um, I said, well, I'm not drinking any whiskey. I'll order uh, some pot. She said, well, if you don't drink some whiskey, I'm going to throw it on you. And I thought she was kidding, see. So I said, well, I'm not drinking. And all I know was she had got there and pulled it down my, on my brand new suit that I had got done. And I don't haven't seen her again yet. I walked away from her. I haven't seen her yet anymore. I knew where she lived too, but I didn't ever bother about it anymore. It was something. All of these things was in my life. I was mixed in. We had, <coughs> we had this man. He would shout all the time. And the preacher would be preaching, and he'd jump up. Whoop! You were. When you hear that, you hear his loose. He'd come around to everybody, and when he got, he hold out his hand to shake him, he wouldn't shake your hand. He would just take it and go pow, like that, right in church. And uh, the kids, all of us, were scared of him. Uh, you know, he, was just, he was frightened with him. So this Sunday, I guess God was took pine with us and stop scaring us. The only light from the church was just a, a one electric thing. And you push that switch up there, but the guy left the flap up and the switch was exposed. He would walk around from day to day, whoop, like that, and shake your hand. And he would walk on the, on the top of the seats, believe it or not. And when he threw his hand over, his hand went into that box of electricity and it knocked him over about five blocks, kaplap. Well, from that day on, he would go whoop and sit right back down where, <laughs> where, where he got up. So say, <laughs> and I'm giving you truth. It's funny, but I'm giving you the gospel truth. He wouldn't get up no more. He just said, whoop, and sit right back down in his place. <clears throat> and we love that. We love that. My father 
was a, a good man. He you know he smoked and he uh, cigars and pipe, but he never inhaled any of the smoke. He, he really he'd blow it out, and he bought the most expensive uh, uh, cigars that you could buy on the counter. And the name of those was Roy Tan. Roy Tan Cigar. And uh, he would smoke them. Just as big and nothing. That's all. And he had his pipe. He used his pipe too. We looked at this kind of stuff and lived at this type of stuff. He sang. He had a beautiful voice and he sang. Three girls were first and my brother Albert was four. <coughs> four. Three other girls were first. And I'm number nine for 13 kids. Uh, and all of us played baseball. And my mother played okay, croquet. She played, she played croquet. And she was exceptionally good at it. I used to laugh because I didn't got big then. And she would just run my dad all over the place with that. And when she would come through the wickets the last time in front of him, she'd go over and rub her hand through his head and shake his head and laugh. Her. So he would take it. He would take, she would take it. And those kind of things that I was exposed to. He worked at the roundhouse over in Shanville, and it was three miles from my house to Shanville. And he walked those three miles there and back three years and never missed a day. <coughs> he was just that kind of a man. Rain or shine, he went. He couldn't catch nobody that was, that was working that shift. So if he had to, he had to walk. That's the only way he could get there. So he walked and never missed a day. And I thought that was the most, oh uh, well, anybody, nobody would do a trick like that. I didn't think they would. But he was, he was a good man. And that's what he took care of his family. That is, <coughs> that's the thing. He took care of his family. He wanted all of his family to be educated too. He only went to the sixth grade. So when I graduated from high school, I went to Tuskegee, Alabama. And guess who I ran into? The little guy that. Uh, she changed peanuts and things. Uh, you know who I'm talking about. He was there at Tuskegee too in the library. He had graduated from school and was being paid there at Tuskegee. And I would go and talk to him. He's a little bit of something like that. And uh, well, it went to two years come there. I left to play baseball. But I could talk to him, George Washington Carver, that was his name. Washington Carver, that was his name. I, was, I could talk to him, but I had to talk to him first. He wouldn't, he wouldn't open his mouth to me until I started talking to him first, and then we had a conversation. And now, if you were ever in Missouri, they have a thing built for him. And it's terrific. And it's in Joplin. It's in Joplin, the thing right, right where he lived. The Q Klux had killed his father, and his mother died, and he was by himself. And he was determined to get an education. Well, he went and took in washings, wash clothes and iron clothes for the wealthy white 
to make the money to go to school. And he did it all through that. He was some guy. He was really some guy. I will never, I'll never forget that man. He wasn't no more than about that big. He wasn't a big man. He could take a break off a plant from a tree. And if it hasn't broke completely off, he could take it and put it back together and it would work again. How he did that, God alone don't know. But he did it. Now in that museum that they built with him in Joplin, Missouri, if you were ever down there, go to see it. It's still there. It's about 10 miles away from uh, where he lived, 42. Um, that's, that's George Washington Carver. Then, I don't know, after we moved, after we moved in Tennessee, things went along good. Went along good. Baseball, baseball. Well, we had two teams. One was for the smaller boys and one for the big guys. Oh, you wouldn't believe it. But we had a ball field right across the street over there. Right over there. Right there in all those years. Long time ago. And that's, what, that's where we played ball. Four of us. My oldest brother was a catcher. My next brother was a first baseman. And my other pitcher was a pitcher. And I was a second baseman. Well, we were over half of everybody. So, well, and we ruled the roost, man. We really ruled the goose. We got uh, the best pitcher in, in Major League Baseball. My brother whipped him. In Louisville, Kentucky, we played a doubleheader. And he whipped him, beat him. I had two for two. And I hit, those were hits off of him. And my brother, he told me, he's always wrong. I said, he just let you hit him. And I said, no, he didn't just let me hit him. He was throwing everything he was hit. But he didn't know about the pigtail and see, but I can, but I could hit that ball, and I did. So that was, it was just a well, Then, my father was working for the railroad. And when he went to Shirenville, his job was to fire engines. They would run the engines up, up on a, a tray where you could get underneath them. And he would have to get underneath those engines and clean out all the fire in them. Wow. And then he'd have to fire them up anew and they'd take them off like that. That was his job. And all of that ashes and stuff, he had to spring it up with a coke and throw it in another coop. He had to do that. And that's hard work. That's hard work. I was a grown man then, and he asked me if I wanted a job there. I told him no. No way, I didn't want it. <clears throat> he was too good a man to fool with. He would do sometimes 10 or 12 engines a day. And that was so much. I don't know how it was. All of these, but we did get to go all over the world. Because when he worked at government, he gave passes. He could get passes. But you couldn't be over 16 as a child to go with your gun. So he'd take us everywhere when we go. That's one thing about it. Well, we would sit on the train. And uh, my mother was playing checkers. And she beat me all the way from uh, Cincinnati to New York City. I haven't won a game yet. <laughs> I haven't won a game yet. She was just that good. I thought I was pretty good, but she, she just won me out of her. And I, that was fine for me. <clears throat> because I liked her too. 
and I did. I was with her with and my kids the day she passed away. She had a ceramic poisoning of the kidney. That was the deal. And she was lying in the bed, and her hand would do like that. And all at once it would just go. Her whole body would be jumping up. That's what I couldn't stand that. I took the kids and I walked out. That was the last time I was with her. I couldn't help but that to see her in that condition. <coughs> But that was it. I was a grown man then and I had children of my own, three of them. So, and that is far, way, way, way back, believe it or not. She was 78 years old when she died. And we were kids, grown kids, and we still stayed as, as a group. And the girls had to slip off to get to get married. The guys, they were, my father would let them have the boyfriend, but they had to come to the home, come to the home where they were, and sit in the living room. And the, my dad would tell them to take their hats and put them in the hats. He wouldn't lie them to put their hats on the head. It wasn't a good taste. And at 11 o'clock, he would give them the hats and show them the door. He'd chase them out. Chase them out. That was the end of the sweetness. Of the... What I didn't really understand about that was he was seeing that there was no pregnancies among his daughters. That was what he was doing. So the guys, the guys couldn't take it. They just went on off, went on off. Once we would go again, go again, go again, go again. Oh, the, now my children, my oldest girl is 64 years old. And the other girl is 62 years old. And the boy, he's in his 50s, about 58 or something like that. I was in World War II, World War II, that's what it was. And uh, uh, these candy bars that this guy make, he drew my name out of the hat in Washington, and my name came out on the front page of the Cincinnati Enquirer. Well, they got me. 1,500 of us was gathered in Kentucky, over here in Kentucky, and we were there for four or five days. <coughs> And we had to learn different things and do different things. Well, just before we left there, 